Well, if you have a Bible with you today, turn over to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. My message, as you can probably see, is hardened. And uh, Jason tried to make me think that was about his abs, and I thought maybe his head, but anyway, oh yeah. Mark chapter 6, we're going to go to verse number 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent them away, he departed into the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that this word is going to touch our hearts today. Because you have prepared our soil. I pray, Lord, that we not have stony hearts like the seed being sown in parable of the sower and the seed in Mark chapter 4. I pray, Lord, that our hearts be open, that we be good ground, and that we produce 30 and 60 and 100 fold. I pray that it will have an effect on us in a way that will bring lasting change, not only to us but those who we are around. We thank you for it today in the name of Jesus. Amen. That last verse, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. I find it interesting that that's the last verse on this passage when he's talking about, I mean, this is one of our most famous uh, situations, Jesus walking on the water. And we know this parable, and it's not a parable, this story. We know that, that uh, they'd, been, they'd been together, and if you back up a little bit into the uh, earlier part of that chapter, you see that they had been together, and they had just fed the 5,000. And all they had was two fishes and some loaves. and uh, Or was it two loaves and five fishes? Anyway. Thanks, DJ. And uh, so, they, so they fed these guys, and there was 5,000 people that got fed. Well, actually, it says 5,000 men that were fed, not counting the women and the children. So no telling how many people actually was fed that day with just that little bit amount, and they took up baskets full after it's all over. They get into the boat. He sends them on across. Here he comes walking on the water, and they are totally, absolutely freaked out. They don't understand what this is. They're seeing some apparition or ghost, and he speaks to them. He gets in the boat. The wind stops pushing against them, but they are amazed. They marveled at this, that this happened, because they didn't get it just hours before. They didn't understand who he was, what he was about, what he could do. If you can take five loaves and two fishes, and you can feed all those people, you could do anything. Amen? Look at the power of that. But it says that their hearts were hardened, which I find to be an interesting word. Basically, uh, we'll look at that in a minute and the definition of it. I find that this whole thing's really interesting anyway, just from the fact that if you look at the other versions of the story, in Matthew chapter 14, we see part of the story that's told there that's not told here, and that is that Peter gets out and walks on the water too, for a little ways anyway. But then he sees the waves, and he starts getting a little fearful, and his faith sinks with him. He does, you know, he sinks, and Jesus has to catch him and ask him, oh, you know, why did you, you know, fear? And in the other gospel that, the, that this story is told, in the uh, gospel of John, it says when Jesus gets into the boat, immediately the boat's at the shore. Now, that's a miracle that I'd never even picked up on before. I mean, think about it. They've been straining. They've been fighting on this thing. He's walking on the water. The waves are going on. Peter's already almost, you know, went under, and they got him in the boat. And it says in this one that the wind ceased, but in John it says immediately they were at the shore. 
Think about that. It doesn't say that they rode there. It just says that immediately they were at the shore. Extra miracles. Now, you would think after all that that these guys would believe anything that happened. Amen? You would think that they would just be 100%. And then I question that. Think about this. How many times has God done something in your life, yet the next time something come up, you totally forgot about how good he was and what he could do and how he protected you and what he did? I've got a friend. He says that one time his wife was driving down the highway and a truck jackknifed. And she didn't even realize it. She was on the other side of the truck when she should have hit it. Did she go through the truck? Did it, how, how that happened? She doesn't know. But she should have probably been killed. Done to Jane Mansfield. Had the top of the, the car taken clear off coming from under. Yeah, get decapitated right under the car. But no, it didn't happen to her. One time I was in a service. And I've probably shared this, I don't know how many times. But I was in a church service one time, and it was at, down at Norville Hayes, the late Norville Hayes. And uh, I was on this side of the room, and I'm trying to remember. I guess it was probably here. I think they had the same setup that we do here. Some churches only have one aisle going down the middle, but this one did have a split uh, section like this, except their middle section was a lot bigger than, uh, than the sides. So I was feeding the line. To tell you what that is, we're, we're ushering, and I was the head usher. Uh, we, were, we were having all these people come up to get prayed for, and, and Norval was notorious for moving so fast you couldn't keep up with him. I mean, he would just bam, bam. He didn't care whether anybody was there to catch him or not. So we had to do the two-man catch. The first guy just slowed him down. <laughs> the second guy tried to drop him on the floor if he could, you know, because sometimes when the power of God hits people in an altar call, I mean, it's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit fall on us, and it's just, you know, it can be very powerful, and we've seen it here hundreds of times. But I'm feeding this line, and the bad thing about, about that church was everything was too close to the altar. There wasn't a lot of room between where somebody would stand to be getting prayer and the pews. And if you wasn't careful, if you moved back too far or did anything, you could fall and hit your head. And I had seen people hit their heads. I've seen people hit the floors and hit their heads. I've, and, and I've never seen anybody get hurt when that happens because the Holy Spirit's on them. And it's just like they don't even, I don't know. I mean, it's amazing. And some of you are nodding your heads. You've seen it and you know. Maybe it's happened to you. Some of you nod heads. Anyway, I saw this lady. You know, people respond differently. Some people just stand there, and that's okay. Some of you have never been what they call slain in the Spirit or resting in the Lord or overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit or whatever, and that's okay too. It doesn't matter. What happens is what God wants to happen, and if that's what he wants to happen, it happens. And some people you can just look at, and, they, you know, they're in the floor. But this lady, she did one of those things and of course the guys like i'm saying we ain't they didn't have guys catching everywhere they had you know you got your one shot you don't go down you're you're on your own she fell she came back and it was like this she was coming right at the pew right about her neck and boom she was on the floor i was like what i was totally blown away I looked at the, there was actually two of us over here because this one guy was supposed to be helping people up, but he was standing there by me. And I said, uh, did she just go through that pew? And he was like, I think she did. You know, he was blown away too. Years later, I get with some of these his classmates and we're sitting there and this one guy, this other guy, this totally different guy starts telling the same story of what he saw. He was an usher on the other side of the room and saw it. But for some reason, we'd never talked together about it. I'm telling you, that was a miracle. Now, have I believed God every time anything's come up since then? No. Why? Because I allow my heart to be hardened. Because even though I can see miracles of God, even though I know his goodness, even though I can see changed lives by what God has done in people's lives and what he's done in my life, even though I can see that the spirit of God is real, it doesn't mean I'm going to believe that miracles are going to happen when they should and can or could because I've hardened my heart. I've, I've 
I allowed my heart to become stony. You know, if the Word of God can't penetrate a stony heart, what can? Because God's Word's supposed to not return null and void, amen? It's supposed to have an effect on people. Now, once the seed of God has been planted in someone, once someone has received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they've asked him to come into their hearts, you would think that that would make a total change in things. But how many of you know that it's probably not that we have hard hearts? We're like Jason. We have hard heads. Amen? Yeah, and knots, yeah. We, we just, for whatever reason, don't get it. We don't, we don't separate in our thinking the reality of God's power and love for us from circumstances, situations, and troubles, and we allow the, the one to overshadow the other. And it becomes like the birds of the air coming to steal the, the uh, seed that's being sown. Or it's like the thorns and the things that grew up and choked it to death. We, we, we shouldn't be allowing that, Amen. Now, in Mark chapter 8, you can flip over there. We'll start in verse 13. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now, the disciples had forgotten to take bread. and They did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because we have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or, nor, or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having ears, do you not see? Or having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, how is it you do not understand? I got an idea if he was here talking to me today, he'd say something like that to me. I mean, honestly, why don't I get it sometimes? Why am I not picking up the pieces and having the fragments of truth in my basket when it's all said and done, why why do not I, why am I not receiving from God the things that I probably should and could have? Because seeing, having eyes I don't see, and having ears I don't hear. You know when we talk about hardened, the word, the definition for that means to petrify or make hard or become callous. The words used metaphorically of spiritual deafness and blindness. Hearers of the gospel who repeatedly resist its convincing truth become insensitive and dull and lose the power of understanding. You know, a lot of times we talk about hardened hearts, and we're talking about people who haven't gotten saved. We're talking about people who are not followers of Jesus. These guys were his disciples. Now, they weren't born again at this point. We understand that. Jesus hadn't died on the cross for them. He hadn't resurrected. So none of that had taken place. So they weren't saved the way that those of us here who've received Christ as our Savior are saved, but they were followers of Christ. Amen? And if anybody should have understood what he was talking about, they should have. But they just didn't get it sometimes. They didn't make the connection between the cause and the effect. They didn't have any bread in the boat. Oh, he's upset because we don't have any bread. The guy could have made you know, a bologna sandwich out of a crumb, you know. He wasn't upset about, about them having bread or not. They wasn't getting it. And this happened after that first case. Feeding the 5,000 in that first trip across the water where Peter walked and all that stuff happened, that's already, that's already happened, and they still don't get it. He feeds another 4,000 with seven loaves, and they still don't get it. So let me ask you a question. What miracle are you not receiving today? 
what area of deliverance in your life or healing or financial breakthrough or whatever it could be is not coming your way because you're just not getting it, that he not only can do it, he wants to. Amen? Our hardened hearts, our stony hearts don't receive the word of God, and we back off, and we don't allow the spirit of God to have his way the way he wants to. Sometimes it's because of the cares of the worlds and the deceitfulness of riches, which is the uh, thorns that come up in the parable of the sower. A lot of times I'd say it's not the deceitfulness of riches for us. It's the deceitfulness of lack of riches. You know, why, why hasn't our church done this or that? Well, you know, if we had the money, if we had the money, we'd do a lot. I had someone tell me the other day that money follows mission. And if we don't have a mission and we're not doing, we're not doing ministry, money follows ministry, it doesn't precede it. You don't get the money first. You start doing it, and the money comes because God honors what you're doing. Amen. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I want to show that it's not just the disciples that were hardened. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. These guys were so hardened, they were trying to lay a trap for him. They were wanting him to do something on the Sabbath, but he, because he is God, knew what was going on, he understood their hearts, and he basically set it up so they couldn't do anything about it publicly. They couldn't put him down or anything because he asked them a question that they wouldn't answer or couldn't answer. The answer should have been, do good. Which one should you do? You should do good, amen? Or do you do evil? And what did they do? Evil. Because of the hardness of their hearts, They turned right around and plotted, basically with their enemies, to get him. Because they weren't big fans of Herod either, and the Herodians. They plotted to destroy him. How many of you know that's, uh, that's a sign of a hardened heart for sure? You know, even Christians can get sucked into schemes and plans and things of the devil. Unfortunately, we can get on some mindset or some track that, that uh, this needs to happen and they ain't going that way, so I'm going to work it out this way and I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to get this and that. And, you know, we can get off track. But these guys are supposed to have been the spiritual leaders of the area. Now, I do appreciate the fact that down the road after Jesus raises from the dead, there are a number of priests who follow the faith. It says that, I think, in the book of Acts. There's a number of them which is good. Some of these guys finally got it, you know, and I don't know. There's a couple of them, Joseph of Arimathea and, and, uh, oh, Nicodemus. They, they already had got it by the time that, that, uh, that Jesus had raised from the dead. But the fact is you can have a hardened heart and be the most religious guy in your community. We, uh, <laughs> I think I mentioned this last summer. We were feeding people down at Pangburn Park summer program. The year before, one of our religious leaders got their nose bent out of shape because we wasn't just feeding children because we fed their parents too, and that wasn't what it was supposed to be about. Turns out every church except that one had been feeding everybody that came up, including all of our workers. And we had I don't know how many workers, helpers from this church and from Versailles that went down and helped with that over a course of the of the week what 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 are what are they seeing but they you know they're not seeing what are what are what's what are they hearing and where are they hearing it from because obviously that wasn't from the spirit of god not at all mark chapter 16 verse 14 says 
Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. They've been with him for three years. That's how long his ministry lasted. So pretty close to the beginning, they were with him, pretty close. Yet, when he's, when he's crucified and people say they saw him, they still don't believe. Another account says that Thomas actually says, unless I can put my, you know, fingers in his hand and his side, I'll not believe. Of course, he shows up and dares Thomas to <laughs> more or less to do it. Hallelujah. Jesus is resurrected. Do you believe that today? Everybody believes the same, amen. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. If he's praying for us, why wouldn't our prayers come true? Unless we're praying against his will, unless we're praying something out of our flesh, and we're praying amiss, according to the Scriptures, we should have anything that we ask if we pray in the name of Jesus. And he's praying for us as well. Now, in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 26 says, and this is after he had fed the people and walked on the water. So we're, we're going to the account after the walking on the water in the Gospel of John. So these people are there, a whole bunch of them. And uh, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So all these people show back up that got fed, the 5,000 people that showed up. They show back up. And he says, you're not here because you saw that miracle or because you've been seeing the miracles and the signs and the wonders, the things that God's trying to show you. You're here because... You want your bellies filled again. People still come for food, amen? Nothing wrong with that if we can also touch their hearts. You know, just having a feeding program without being able to minister to people, uh, we're, we, we struggle a little bit at the food pantry. I do anyway. I mean, the food pantry is a good thing. A tenth of this area goes and gets food if you can believe that. And they're not the ones who are the lowest strata who have, who have uh, food stamps and stuff. And there may be some of them there too. But uh, these are a lot of people that, you know, somebody in the household's working. They just don't make enough. And they got a bunch of kids and they can't afford to, to uh, put them in daycare because daycare is so expensive. So it wouldn't make any sense for somebody other to go to work. Uh, also, there's, you know, people who are less fortunate and have disabilities and different things and some seniors who are on fixed incomes that come. But because we get our food from gleaners, we're tied into this government thing, and they don't want us telling people about Jesus. We're not allowed to proselytize. Now, we can tell them about our churches, and we went down last Wednesday, and we gave them uh, invitations to pass out to the people to a community meal here at the church. That's all it says, more or less. They're welcome to come to a community meal. We don't know how many is going to show up. We don't know how many. How, I don't even know if we know how many of you are going to show up to help serve. But we're not doing it like we are today. It's not a time of fellowship for us or a time for the two churches to get together, which is an important thing, according to the uh, report that we got back from our assessment with uh, Brother Jeff Carlson. But uh, this this is just to reach out and to minister to people. We will have a short presentation of the gospel for them, though. Now, it says in verse 35. Let's go there. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Jesus will take anyone that comes to him, anyone who wants to follow him, anyone who will believe in him. For I have not come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but raise it up 
at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then the Jews complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. (laughs) Now these guys obviously are not getting it. He's basically telling them, if you believe in me, you can have everlasting life. You can have salvation. Now, I know that you and I, all of us, have probably spoken to someone about Jesus who chose not to believe. They didn't believe. They never received him as their Lord and Savior. Maybe they had hardened hearts. Uh, Maybe their ears were dull of hearing. In some cases, maybe they just hadn't heard it enough because I understand, you know, statistically speaking, someone has to hear the gospel five or six times before they receive it in many cases. That wouldn't be every case. But what do these guys do? They go back to the whole thing about the bread again. What is it with the bread? What is the deal with the bread? You know? Well, it, comes, it becomes worse because Jesus doesn't stop there. And if we go to verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, And I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. And these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now, pause there for a moment. Is Jesus literally saying that they're actually going to have to eat his flesh and drink his blood? No. I mean, anybody who reads that ought to be able to see that he's speaking metaphorically that he through his sacrifice, is providing for them access into heaven. He's providing for them freedom from sin and other things. Do they get it? No, they don't get it. In fact, as we read on, therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. Obviously, it's not about the flesh. It's not about filling your belly with the bread. It's not the point. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and he who, would, who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have come to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with, no, walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Oh, wait a minute. Peter's got it. Somewhere along the line, Peter's heart got opened up. Him and the others stayed. Even Judas, who had his own plan going. But now think about that. A lot of his disciples, in this case, the word was hard. Oh, this is hard. That's hard to understand. That's a hard thing to understand. You know, I think that a lot of stuff are hard to understand. Amen. I don't understand television. I could not explain to you how I get TV at my house. I don't understand how cable works. I didn't understand it when it was just those uh, tubes. <laughs> I still don't understand it. I may understand things less nowadays. I don't understand how to work on a car anymore because it has to be hooked up to a computer, and I don't know anything about that. Used to, you could just start a car by jumping to Bendix with a screwdriver. You can't do that anymore. Some of you older folks remember that days. 
There's a lot of things I don't understand. There's things in this Bible I don't understand. But when we see him, we're going to know it all. If we've asked Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, if we've received of this bread of heaven, if our hearts are not hardened, if we're not turning a hard heart towards God where he can't get in, then he can penetrate to the depths of our soul and he can nourish us and feed us with his goodness on a daily basis as we heard today from what Joanna said, we can be filled, amen, and we can be filled with the spirit of the living God. Now, Lord, I pray for every person in this room that their hearts not be hardened. Lord, that we would have eyes that see and ears that hear, that we could receive the word of God, that we would be good ground, producing fruit from the word of God we hear. I thank you in advance for all the people who are going to be involved in our outreach because they understand that's why you came. You came to give eternal life. You came to see people's lives changed. And I thank you, Lord, that that's going to happen. And I thank you, Lord, for these people that are going to be here today and have this time of fellowship. And I ask that you be with them. And I don't know if we're praying over the food later, but I pray over it even now. And I thank you that you will bless it and our fellowship. And I pray, Lord, that the two churches can fellowship together. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.